So this chapter is on your autonomic nervous system. It will consist of motor neurons that will innervate anything under subconscious level. So it'll innervate things that you guys are not aware of happening. So your smooth muscles, your cardiac muscles, your glands, things that are involuntary, it will make adjustments to ensure that optimal support for body activities is achieved. So it will shunt or kind of divert blood to areas that need it and adjust the heart rate, blood pressure, and all of your digestive processes. Um, it's also called the involuntary nervous system or the general visceral motor system. Um, so again, in comparison to your somatic motor system, which is all of your skeletal voluntary muscle control, uh, the autonomic nervous system is anything subconsciously controlled. And we divide your autonomic nervous system over here into the sympathetic and parasympathetic division. And again, your test focuses on probably most 90, 80% of the questions from this chapter are on understanding the differences uh, between these two. Uh, both have motor fibers, but they differ in where their effectors will go or where they'll end. Uh, they're efferent pathways, so what their pathways consist of, and then their target organ responses to neurotransmitters. Um, the somatic nervous system, as a review, innervates skeletal muscles, and your ANS will innervate um, anything under subconscious control, cardiac smooth, and glands. Uh, the somatic nervous system has a cell body, which is your central nervous system, and a single thick myelinated group A axon. The ANS pathway uses a two neuron chain made up of a preganglionic neuron. Um, it's a cell body within your central nervous system. Um, that will have a myelinated axon extended to the ganglion where a synapse will occur. Um, the ganglion is where the cell bodies are of these neurons. And then the postganglionic neuron will always be the neuron outside of your central nervous system. So it'll be in your spinal, peripheral nerves. Um, the, the cell body will synapse with a preganglionic axon in the autonomic ganglion with a non-myelinated postganglionic axon that extends to the effector organ. In your somatic nervous system, because we deal with skeletal muscles, the neurotransmitter is usually always acetylcholine. That's our neurotransmitter for muscles, skeletal muscles. The effect is always stimulatory, um, but in your autonomic nervous system, your preganglionic fibers will release acetylcholine to the ganglia, and the postganglionic fibers could release norepinephrine or acetylcholine at its effectors. And its effect, unlike your somatic nervous system, can be um, stimulatory or inhibitory. So it can stimulate an action or it can inhibit an action. And that just depends on what type of receptors are there. Um, some overlap of your somatic and autonomic function. Uh, your higher brain centers will regulate and coordinate both. Most spinal and cranial nerves contain both somatic and autonomic fibers, and adaptations usually involve both skeletal muscles and visceral organs. Um, for exa example, your active muscles, if you're exercising, require more oxygen and glucose. So your autonomic nervous system will work in conjunction with that and will help to speed up your heart rate and open airways to get oxygen into the body and delivered to your skeletal muscles faster. Uh, so here's a look at a comparison between your somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And again, the autonomic nervous system, we divide into a sympathetic and parasympathetic division. It can be stimulatory or inhibitory. This describes the pathway um, and of how these neurotransmitters are released and then transferred to their target organs. So this is a great picture to just study to kind of compare um, the two ANS with your somatic nervous system, and then within the AS to look at how the para and sympathetic kind of differ, and we'll go into that too. So here are the two branches of the ANS. Um, the parasympathetic division promotes maintenance functions can, and conserves energy. So your parasympathetic is your rest and digest division, and your sympathetic division will mobilize the body during activity to be well aware of the surroundings. Um, it's usually activated in some sort of stressful res response or environment. And within these two kind of divisions of the ANS, a lot of the organs are duly innervated, meaning they're, the, a lot of your visceral internal organs are innervated by both. 
Um, but a lot of the innervations will cause opposite effects to those organs. So for example, the sympathetic division will increase the heart rate and the parasympathetic division will decrease the heart rate. Um, there's a dynamic antagonism or opposite effect of these systems um, between the two divisions and that helps to maintain homeostasis. So if the heart rate is too high, the parasympathetic division will be activated to try to lower heart rate, lower heart rate and vice versa. So here's your parasympathetic division. It keeps body energy use as low as possible, even while carrying out maintenance activities. So it'll be um, involved in digestion, diuresis, defecation. Um, so for example, a person relaxing and reading after a meal, the blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rates will become low. The GI tract activity is high as the digestive tract is working to digest the food. The pupils will become constricted because they don't need to dilate to take in extra light because you're just resting. Um, and the lenses will become accommodated for close vision. Role of the sympathetic division is the opposite of that. So this is our fight or flight system. Um, it's mobilized during activity, exercise, excitement, emergency, embarrassment will all kind of get this system activated. It will increase your heart rate um, you'll get a dry mouth because your salivary glands will decrease saliva secretions. Um, you might get cold, sweaty skin, dilated pupils as they're trying to be more aware of the surroundings so more light can enter the eye. Um, it's during vigorous physical activity that um, it'll shunt the blood to the skeletal muscles and the heart because that's where blood and oxygen are needed. It will dilate your bronchioles. Your bronchioles are in your lungs. So as your bronchioles dilate and increase their diameter, you'll get more airflow into your lungs, which means more oxygen um, can get to your muscles and heart. It will also cause the liver to release glucose. So glucose is stored in the liver as glucagon, um, as glycogen, excuse me, and glucose being released will just serve as an energy source to create excess ATP. So it gives you extra energy. There's three main differences between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And I'm just gonna pause here. These two slides, the role of the parasympathetic and the role of the sympathetic, you could probably study just these two slides and memorize them and answer at least half of the questions right from just this chapter. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, the sites or organ, your parasympathetic fibers from those neurons are craniosacral, meaning they will originate in the cranial region, the brain, and the sacral spinal cord. And the sympathetic fibers are what we call thoracolumbar, meaning their fibers in, originate in the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. You should know that as well. The relative lengths of fibers, the parasympathetic has long preganglionic and short postganglionic fibers. Um, the sympathetic has the opposite to that. So just kind of opposite lengths of fibers where they're located, whether it's the preganglionic, that first neuron, or the postganglionic, the second. And then the location of ganglia, the parasympathetic ganglia are, are all located in or near the visceral effector organ. And again, the ganglia are the cell bodies of their neurons. Whereas the sympathetic ganglia lie close to the spinal cord in that sympathetic trunk which you might have learned from anatomy. So here is another great chart to study. Um, again, maybe one or two questions will come off of this chart. What is the parasympathetic known as? Uh, the craniosacral division. And the sympathetic is known as the thoracolumbar division. And then the length of their preganglionic and postganglionic fibers. Um, knowing exactly what each goes to innervate isn't highly important. I more just want you to know uh, what the systems do in opposite action to each other on your heart, your lungs, your blood vessels, salivary glands, digestive tract, thing like that, things like that. This is an also great chart to study, kind of just to review what we just talked about. Um, the parasympathetic, again, is called the craniosacral division. Its long preganglionic fibers will extend from your central nervous system almost all the way to the target organs but it'll synapse with postganglionic neurons in the terminal ganglia that are close to or within those target organs themselves. And then the short postganglionic fibers will synapse with the effectors and they'll be much shorter uh, because it's already gotten super close to the target organ itself. 
And you can see that here, the preganglionic fibers are incredibly long. Um, the synapse occurs on the ganglia within the region of the target organ, and then there's ex an extremely short postganglionic fiber. Um, this gate takes you through kind of the, the cranial part of it and where the preganglionic fibers run in. Um, it'll take you through some of the cranial nerves. I don't think I ask you too many questions about the specifics of this and the cranial nerves and what they specifically stimulate. So I'm gonna kind of pass over this. Um, I like talking about the vagus nerve because it's the only nerve that innervates organs in the thoracic and um, abdominal cavities. Um, then the sacral part of the parasympathetic will branch off to form your pelvic splanchnic nerves. Um, and it'll innervate things like the large intestine, your urinary bladders, your urinaries, your reproductive organs. Um, so think of the digestive organs because we're in the parasympathetic division. And this is another great picture just showing the organs it innervates. Uh, the sympathetic division is also known as your thoracolumbar division. Um, some structures innervated by this, only the sympathetic are your sweat glands, the erector pili muscle, which gives you goosebumps when it causes your hairs to stand up straight. And then the smooth muscles of all blood vessels, uh, causing them to constrict or dilate. So here's a look at the sympathetic division and where these neurons are being located. Um, you can see here the difference is that the preganglionic fibers will be short the postganglionic fibers will then be long as they go to the target organ, um, and the ganglia will be close to the spinal cord, and those ganglia in the sympathetic division are called the sympathetic trunk, and they run on either side of the spinal cord in a ladder-like structure. Hopefully that's a little familiar. Um, the preganglionic fibers pass through white rami, communicants, communicantes or communicants, and enter that sympathetic trunk, ganglia, and the ganglia will vary in size, position, and number. There are 23 paravertebral ganglia in the sympathetic trunk, and this is kind of where they're located along the spinal cord itself. And this is just showing you where this, these sympathetic trunk ganglia are located. And again, this will be the place of the synapse from the preganglionic axon neuron to the postganglionic neuron. Um, a little more about this trunk ganglia. I'm gonna skip over, this is just where the synapse occurs. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to know any more information about that. Um, yeah, I think you guys have enough to learn. I'm gonna skip over a little bit of this. This will take you through kind of the pathway of how it goes into the spinal cord and then will come out the motor or um, ventral root, the front side and then synapse within that ganglion and then continue on to the target organ or the effector. And the same thing kind of takes you through that. Um, pathways to the head, these fibers will emerge from T1 to T4. Um, these will innervate the areas of the head. It'll stimulate the dilator muscles of your iris. So again, big picture, sympathetic will dilate the um, pupil. It'll innervate smooth muscle of the eyelid and there will also be a branch to the heart from these fibers to help increase heart rate. Uh, to the thorax, you'll have more fibers innervating the heart, the thyroid gland, the skin, the lungs where it will dilate the bronchioles as well as your esophagus. So again, pictures of what the sympathetic division of the ANS goes to um, and parts that it innervates. And it's nice to see here, here it's known as the thoracolumbar division short preganglionic fibers um, synapsing on the sympathetic trunk ganglia, and then the long postganglionic fibers will go to the effectors or the target organs. Um, and I think I'm gonna kind of feel okay about that so far. This again shows a pathway, three different types of pathway of sympathetic innervation. Um, I, don't, I don't think I ask any pathway questions um, if you're interested in reading the three different pathways, you're welcome to do that. Um, but I don't really ask you specifics about the pathways to the abdominum, the pelvis. Um, I'm just gonna move this so I can see it a little more. In the adrenal medulla, this is interesting to note this because some of the preganglionic fibers pass directly to the adrenal medulla without synapsing. 
And your adrenal medulla can secrete hormones that also account for the adrenaline response or the stress response. So these hormones will be stimulated by your sympathetic division and help to increase the adrenaline or stress response. Uh, so norepinephrine and no epinephrine are those two hormones that will get released into the blood to help with that. And they are being released from the adrenal medulla, um, which is a part of your adrenal glands, which is on top of your kidneys. So here's just showing how sympathetic nerve fibers will innervate the adrenal medulla, which is the inner kind of layer of the adrenal glands on top of the kidneys. And they that in, innervation from the sympathetic will release epinephrine and norepinephrine into your bloodstream. Visceral reflexes and visceral sensory neurons, this, these will send information about any sort of chemical change, stretch, temperature, and ir irritation of the viscera. Uh, the receptors for the visceral senses are free nerve endings. They're widely scattered throughout your organs. Um, cell bodies are located in the dorsal root ganglia and sensory ganglia. Um, and axons will travel in the same nerves as your autonomic motor fibers. So for example, parasympathetic fibers of your vagus nerve. Um, visceral reflex arcs. So just like we talked about reflex arcs with your somatic muscles, your skeletal muscles, we also have reflex arcs of your visceral muscles. And they're set up really with the same components. They have receptors, sensory neurons, then an integration center, which will be in the brain or spinal cord, and then a motor neuron and effector. Um, there's three main differences. The visceral reflex arc has two consecutive neurons in the motor pathway. Um, that was the pre and post ganglionic neuron. Uh, it has the afferent fibers will be visceral sensory neurons coming only from viscera. And the effectors, unlike going to skeletal muscle, which are voluntary, they'll just be all involuntary responses. Um, an example of a visceral reflex is a reflex that empties the rectum and the bladder. Uh, these neuron reflex arcs will exist in the walls of the GI tract. Um, so you might think, well, this isn't an involuntary response because we control when we go to the bathroom. Um, but this will be a reflex that empties the rectum and the bladder. And what's a voluntary control is the sphincter um, that allows the waste to pass through the body. So here's a visceral reflex. It takes you through the receptor, the sensory neuron integration center, the motor neuron, which will always be the pre and post ganglionic, and then the visceral effector, which will initiate the response from the initial stimulus that it received. Um, a little bit about neurotransmitters. Um, the major neurotransmitters like we talked about are acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Um, acetylcholine is released by the preganglionic axons and all parasympathetic postganglionic axons. And norepinephrine is released by almost all sympathetic postganglionic axons. Um, the effects of these two different neurotransmitters depend on whether it binds to what we call a cholinergic receptor or an adrenergic receptor. So there's just two types of receptors that these two neurotransmitters will bind to. Um, the two types of cholinergic receptors that bind to acetylcholine will be nicotinic and muscarinic, and they're named after drugs that bind to them and will mimic the acetylcholine effects like nicotine or muscarine, which is a type of poison from mushrooms. Um, I don't ask you guys too much about these different receptors. We don't get into it that much, um, but these just are different receptors that will bind to these uh, neurotransmitters. Um, there's two major types of receptors that will respond to norepinephrine. There's alpha and beta, and they're subdivided into their own classes. Um, the effects depend on which subclass of receptor will predominate on the target or organ. So just know that there are different um, receptors and different names for these receptors, depending on what type of um, neurotransmitter it is. They'll have a different um, effect on the binding. It'll activate, it could inhibit. Um, but just know that each of the neurotransmitter will bind to a specific type of receptor depending on the location, and that will have um, an excitation, an activation, or an inhibit, some sort of inhibitory effect on the target organ itself. 
Um, there are different drug classes that will bind to these different receptors to mimic or stimulate a similar effect that, that, um, that a neurotransmitter could have on that same type of receptor. So it's interesting to read through some of these drug classes and see the clinical application of them. So a lot of drugs that we take um, act on these specific type of receptors because they'll mimic the effect of a neurotransmitter to either inhibit or um, enhance some sort of parasympathetic or sympathetic response in the nervous system. Um, hypertension drugs, I'm talking about uh, beta blockers specifically because that might be one of your test questions. So I don't ask you many, really any questions except the beta blockers. Um, beta blockers will block the beta receptors and that'll decrease blood pressure. Um, so that's what people take with high blood pressure with hypertension. They will take a beta blocker because it's blocking that beta receptor. And um, kudos to you guys for being here in class because you'll get that question right on the exam. Otherwise, I don't think I ask any other questions about um, receptors and drugs, but beta blockers you probably have heard of and um, hypertension affects many of us. So, um, all right, a little more parasympathetic and sympathetic interactions. This is an important part because it'll talk about how most of our visceral organs are duly innervated and these divisions have antagonistic effects. So pay attention to maybe these next couple slides. Um, one division will usually predominate in an organ. In a few cases, the divisions have a cooperative effect um, very rarely, but in a few instances. Uh, antagonistic interactions, this describes how these antagonistic will allow for precise control of visceral activity, what the sympathetic division will do to increase heart and respiratory rates, it will inhibit digestion and elimination of wastes, and the parasympathetic division has the antagonistic effect to that. It'll decrease heart and respiratory rates, and it will allow for digestion and discarding of wastes. Um, sympathetic and parasympathetic tone um, has to do with the blood. Basically, when you, we're talking about tone, we're talking about muscle. Um, almost all blood vessel, smooth muscle is entirely innervated by sympathetic fibers only. So this division controls blood pressure even at rest. So your sympathetic will be either inhibited um, or stimulated to increase or decrease blood pressure by constricting these blood vessels or increasing blood vessels. Um, so sympathetic tone is the continual state of a partial constriction of blood vessels. If blood pressure drops, your sympathetic fibers will fire faster than normal to just constrict these blood vessels and cause your blood pressure to rise. And if blood pressure rises, your sympathetic fibers will um, be inhibited or they'll, they'll fire less than normal causing dilation of your vessels, which will lead to a decrease in blood pressure. And this just allows your sympathetic system to have really precise control on where it shunts your blood to. So um, in terms of a um, stressful situation or if you're exercising, your sympathetic system will shunt or direct blood to your skeletal muscles that need more oxygen. The parasympathetic division normally dominates your heart and the smooth muscle of the GI tract and the urinary tract. It will slow the heart and dictate normal activity levels of your GI tract. And these organs also exhibit parasympathetic tone where they are always slightly activated. Uh, the sympathetic division could override these effects during times of stress. Um, drugs that block parasympathetic responses will increase your heart rate and also cause uh, fecal and urinary retention. Uh, some more cooperative effects um, are seen in the control of external genitalia uh, with e erection and ejaculation. I don't think I ask you any questions about this, but this is the one example um, where the two work in cooperation. So for example, the parasympathetic fibers cause vasodilation, which is responsible for erection, and then the sympathetic fibers will cause ejaculation. So that's kind of the one and only instance where they're working for the common goal. Um, other unique roles of your sympathetic division, thermoregulatory response to heat. Um, when body temperature rises, your sympathetic nerves will dilate your skin blood vessels to try to allow heat to escape, also to activate 
sweat glands. And when body tempers, temperatures drop, your blood vessels will constrict to try to conserve body temperature um, within the trunk of the body. Uh, release of renin from your kidneys. Your sympathetic system causes the release of renin, which basically just activates a system to increase blood pressure. Um, renin is a part of a system that just helps to constrict blood vessels uh, by using um, a protein called angiotensin. Metabolic effects will increase the metabolic rates of cells. Um, it raises blood glucose levels. And again, that's to try to get energy available um, for cells that need it and will mobilize fats for also use as fuels um, in a sympathetic response. All right, let's see where we at here because I think I covered a lot. Yeah, we're almost done. Um, localized versus diffuse effects. Um, trying to think of, this is probably a great chart to just, I think I'm gonna end kind of with this chart and we'll get through kind of the rest of this, but this is also a great chart that summarizes the two divisions um, and the parasympathetic and the sympathetic effects and what it does. And again, if you study this one chart, probably three or four questions will be taken just off this chart with what the parasympathetic effects is and the sympathetic effects are. Um, if you're interested in any sort of clinical applications, autonomic neuropathy is damage to your autonomic nerves. That's a common complication of diabetes mellitus. Um, some symptoms, um, sexual dysfunction, dizziness after standing, urinary incontinence. So this can sometimes be a complication of diabetes. Um, neuropathy, the best way to pre prevent it is to maintain good blood glucose levels and to not allow diabetes to get out of control. Um, the ANS is under control of your central nervous system. Um, and I think this takes us through how this, the central nervous system will coordinate and control all effects. Um, your hypothalamus, centers in your hypothalamus will control all the heart activity, blood pressure, temperature, all of your emotional responses as well. Um, and I think this is all that I want to do because I kind of covered, I don't really cover any sort of control from your ANS in your test. Um, a disorder with hypertension could be due to overactive sympathetic vasoconstrictor response to stress. Um, so when we think about stress leads to high blood pressure, this is why, because constantly um, kind of putting your sympathetic into gear will cause your sympathetic vasoconstrictor response to be an overactive. So that's why stress sometimes leads to hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, this causes your heart to work harder and your artery walls are subject to increased wear and tear. And again, it can be treated with any adrenergic receptor blocking drugs. Um, other kind of dysfunctions, I'll let you guys read through on your own, but I don't ask you questions about them. Um, common in Raynaud's disease. And I think I'm gonna end there.